So the trenching is 11,034 meters. Mm. And uh, I'm doing it on Box Hill, which the iconic yeah. Box Hill, probably <laughs> London's most well-known climb that's not in London. Um, I'll do some uh, Zwift Box Hill rips out of sympathy then. <laughs> what are the what are the ninety one of them? Ninety one. Yeah. Oh, I was looking at the the PRL loop on Zwift. That course is like twelve times up Box Hill, and I was thinking, oh, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> ninety one. Oh, jeepers. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I did. I I basically I wanted a hill that I could rep ninety one times. And the reason for 91 is uh, basically in the UK, men's suicide rates uh, is a pretty alarming stat as it is, but I think it will be higher next oh, year. Oh, yeah. I but, remember seeing that. Yeah. yeah. It's 91 a week at the moment, which is crazy. Right. So I wanted to find a hill that would take 91 reps. And then I was like, oh, Fox Hill, that's 91 reps. So I did the maps and I was like, that's convenient because it's not close to me, but it's relatively close. And it's quite like iconic, I guess. Yeah, everyone knows it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I know it. <laughs> and you're literally on the other side of the world. <laughs> yeah, I'm about as far away from it as you can get. So yeah. that's a good uh, one. So, yeah, it's, um, have you ever ridden it properly? No, I haven't. No, I've been to London. I've done like the classic London routes, Regent's Park and Richmond Park. <laughs> but I haven't done Box Hill. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's from Richmond Park. It's still probably an hour or so on a bike. It's pretty solid, isn't it? Yeah. And then... A wee way out. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's quite... I mean, it's really pretty. It, mm. It's not that bad. I mean, the average is, I think, 5%. Like, it's not, it's not crazy. No, it seems, it seems nice on Zwift. Yeah, yeah. It's the I think one of the hairpins is where it's a bit steep. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think it, it gets can... quite busy during the day, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. This is yeah, part, of my, that... part of my conundrum at the moment. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah. Been trying to work Just out. Still through the night. Yeah. Well, I worked out. It's going to be about four hundred and fifty kilometers. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, That's a very gentle gradient then. Yeah, exactly. As far as challenges go, like sometimes you see the Everests and they're like well under 200k. But for 3,000 metres more and like 300 kilometres more. Oh. Yeah, I know. I, it's it's going to suck. Oh. And I've, I've like, this week I've just slept terribly because I've been doing that whole like tossing and turning trying to work out. Uh, what time should I start? All this kind of thing. And I basically settled on six o'clock in the morning because if I started really early, I'm just mm. going to have a bad night's sleep. Like a really bad night's sleep. Yeah. But then at least... Even I, worse than you're going to get. Yeah, exactly. Like if I start at six, it's still going to be quite... I'm still going to get... I mean, it's not a lot of sleep, but because I guarantee you're going to sleep shit anyway, but it'll be yeah. a better night's sleep than waking up at Three, for example. Will you stay closer to like to Box Hill the night before? Yeah, so it's funny. So lockdown here, and we'll get onto that subject in a minute where you are. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so lockdown here, there is there's it's supposed to be a lockdown at the moment. And it's mm. it's quite weird. It's not I don't think people are kind of taking it seriously. But um, I think it's got to that point all over the world, hasn't it? Yeah. It was like that in Spain as well. Yeah. 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 Um, but basically, there's a hotel at the bottom, and I messaged them explaining what I was doing. And, I was, and it's like, I think it's like 300, 400 meters from the start of Box Hill. And I messaged them, yeah. look, I'm doing this. It's kind of work. It is for charity. Would you be, because hotels aren't supposed to be open apart from special exemptions and for work. And okay. So I, I messaged him and was like, look, if, if, it, if, you, if I can't, not a problem. I'll just rent a car and drive over. If, if I can, it makes things a lot easier. And they were like, yeah, we'll accept it. So stay oh, there. Nice. Yeah, staying there tomorrow night and then um, staying there on Sunday night as well. 
Because... Oh, I've just lost, lost track of time, but the weekend's actually like not very far away. <laughs> you're, well, yeah, you're 30 now. You've had Thursday. You're going into Friday now. Yeah, yeah. It's Thursday night, so. Mm. Talking about future, the fu- you're literally in the future, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I'll be riding up Box Hill before you. Yeah, you're basically Doc. <laughs> On Swift. You are Doc from Back to the Future. Yeah, I can tell you how you go if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be good. <laughs> I'd like to know in advance how I'm going to feel. Yeah, okay, yeah. Be like, okay, 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 shit, shit, shit. Fucking tired. Really, really fucking tired. Really, really fucking tired. Probably. Sleep. <laughs> Probably should have taken a gel like half an hour ago. I can like inform you. <laughs> yeah. Remember that gel? Take it now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in contrast, uh, it's slowly lighting up here in grey and dreary London on a very wintry morning. And in contrast, you're in. Oh, it's winter as well. Oh. Yeah. 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 I forget about that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm actually quite envious of the fact that you're in going into summer now. Yeah, um, that's great. <laughs> but you're going to double a, down. You're stuck in a hotel for another four days. Yeah, I get out on Monday, so I can slowly see the light at the end of the tunnel now. And it's not actually that bad. Like I've, I've been having quite a good time. It's been quite comfortable, quite relaxing. But at the same time, it will be quite nice to get out. So I'm slowly counting down the days now. And they were initially going quite fast, but now they're really just slowly ticking over towards Monday. But it's been good. How many, how many days have you had to be quarantining for? For 14. So I arrived in the country last Monday at 9.30. And then as soon as the flight lands, that's when they count the 14 days. So then I was bused to another city and then I started, then I was put into a hotel, and then I get out of the hotel at 9.30 on mm. Monday. So, exactly two weeks. 336 hours. <laughs> not that you counted. No, not So what have you, uh, oh, are you frozen? Hello. You're frozen in a really exactly. hilarious position, hilarious photograph right now. Ah, they're back. Um, what have you managed to do? I'm doing Zoom and blaming my Wi-Fi. So, um, I've been pretty productive actually. Just been doing general life admin, I guess. Mm-hmm. Got a few emails and just organising a few things and regarding uni next year. Swifting a lot, swifting every day. Mm. Hello. Oh no. That made the days go a little bit slower, but in the afternoons, I like to get out in the car park, do a few laps, <laughs> laps around the outdoor, like the exercise area outdoors. <laughs> read a book, um, been trying to practice my Spanish, but it's been, it's been quite nice. Yeah. I've got quite a lot of like emailing done and that sort of thing. Email, admin, life admin completed. Life admin. Yeah. That's the one. I had quite a bit of it to do. So like visas and just stuff like that. But yeah, ring the bank, you know, just, just the usual adulting stuff which I'm not uh, very good at. I'm terrible at it. I'm really useless at it. <laughs> I'd like to think I've got better at it and I haven't. I just yeah. do it as much as I can. Like prime example, this. I don't know if you've ever seen, have you ever seen one of these? Do you know what this is? Is it, is it a calculator? <laughs> Nearly. It's so we have a lot, <laughs> a lot of the banks in the UK, the older banks, this is from an old mm. bank nationwide. Uh, you have to have one of these, a card reader, to be able to log into your bank on your phone. Only, only for the first, no. only the first time you do it, and also you have to use it to. But like, that's pay. very backwards. Yeah, and you have to set it up for like new payments and stuff like that. You have to have one of them. I lost it, and I bought a new phone. 
your phone. And yeah. I couldn't figure out where the, literally had no idea where it was. So to then be able to get hold of it, you have to like, call up your bank with your bank customer number, which is only, you can only see it if you're logged into your bank account and you can't log into your bank account without one. So it's just like, so I basically just guess. What? Yeah, I just guessed what was in my bank for a couple of weeks until, until I managed to figure <gasps> out what it was. Eventually, eventually figured out where it was and uh, it was in a, in a, in a drawer. But oh, wow. I like how you had that handy to the camera though, like just sitting beside you. It's because I saw it out yesterday. That's literally it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it took me all off about two weeks to bite the bullet and actually do Seems like the UK banks are back in the 1990s with that sort of technology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have like, there's one called Monzo, which is amazing. And like, they're all online and really cool app and stuff. But like older banks, like this one, Nationwide, mm. uh, NatWest, TSB, just really, really backwards. But then there's all these like new, yeah. kind of like tech focused banks, like like Monzo, which is actually really, really good. So I've mm. been slowly like switching everything over to Monzo. <laughs> I just think it's better. Yeah, it's much I easier. would as well. Yeah, yeah. If I didn't have to have one of those little devices, it's just like it's just another thing, isn't it? It's an unnecessary yeah. thing. <laughs> it's like why? Why do it's I need a calculator? This? Yeah, it, it does look like a calculator as well, to be fair. And it has like funny, but it's all like like weird pixely screen and has funny buttons like identify, respond, and sign. Anyway, <laughs> that thing. Me Gosh. So, you, what is pretty cool about you is you won the Zwift Academy. Yes, I did. And, 2018. And Paul, Time flies. Um, yeah, um, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago to be honest i remember it yeah it's surprisingly a long time ago now yeah seeing as we're going into 2021 yeah but 2020's not happened i'm not going to be a year older yeah like it, it doesn't count <laughs> it's been written really, off yeah but yeah what i remember about that zwift academy was i think you pull the best pain faces in the world I still do. It's just it's like, a classic trait. <laughs> it's proper. I'm never pretty on a bike, that's for sure. But that's, I mean, it, it, it looks like you're giving it all. That's the most important bit. Yeah, I looked like that today on Zwift as well. It's just a regular thing. What was, uh, what was the session on Zwift today? I did the four horsemen, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 90k, 2,000 metres of climbing. I was crawling by the end. <laughs> I, I had to go into my emergency jet plane stash that I was given for <laughs> the treats for uh, bingo the other night because we had like a, a hotel quarantine bingo and they brought the bingo cards along with dinner and then it also came with a little pack of jet planes. So I saved those for when I thought I'd need them most, which was in the Zwift round today. And luckily they came in handy. <laughs> it's so good though that they, they actually sound like they're being really, the quarantining of the hotel sounds good. Organising bingo. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. Like, yeah. only the cool kids go to the bingo, go to the Zoom sessions, though. Like, you see some weirdos wandering around that you haven't really seen before because they mostly hang out in their rooms and they don't talk to anyone. And then it's all, like, the sociable, like, cool kids that go to the actual Zoom classes and do the flax weaving and do the bingo and that sort of thing. So, it's, pre it's pretty good. I mean, that doesn't actually sound too bad, to be honest. Like, it sounds better than the one. Yeah. Like quarantining in the UK would be like yeah. I've got a few friends who are sort of 50 60 year olds but we get along well all right do they always <laughs> yeah, exactly. what do you do do you get that question from them oh I'm pretty sure I got quite a few looks today like today would have definitely confirmed to everyone that I'm just slightly odd like spending three three hours 20 on the erg and just having the army officers walking past and then people coming and going from the exercise area just walking past my room seeing me there and then walking past an hour later and I was still there they must have just thought I was bizarre but yeah I think they just accept it just accept I'm one of those people I you see I find I actually quite like long turbo sessions and I think a big reason for it is that because where, where I am I'm like central London for me to get any mm. 
for me to get to any good road, it's like the, the closest, I guess, good bit of road is Regent's Park, which is still shit. But for me to, yeah. get, <laughs> to get to anything that's half decent, it's an hour's ride, at least an hour. So yeah. I, my head's always like, say I've got three hours to do, I really have to add like two hours to either side of that to be able to do mm. anything. So then it yeah, exactly. Like that, which is a long, is you know, it's a, that's a long ride. So I'm quite comfortable sitting on a turbo trainer for three hours. Um, yeah, I don't mind it. And once you once you've got it in your head that you're going to be there for a long time, like it do, it doesn't seem so bad. Like if you're going on there for to do sixty minutes or to do ninety minutes, mm. it just takes forever. But if you know that you're going to be there for multiple hours on end, then it's fine. Like this, the first sixty minutes just flies by. Yeah. And especially if you've got a course to follow as well, then if you know where you're going and you know that you've got to go up Alpine Swift in a couple of hours' time, then it's not so bad. <laughs> you're already prepared. You just line up all your snacks. That's what I do. I like, yeah, exactly. Like, Check them off. I'm going to have this one at this point, this one at this point, this one then, this one then, this one then. Water bottles are lined up. Everything's already prepared. And I have this thing. Yeah. I always do this thing, which I call... I talk about it loads. It's what I call barriers to completion, basically. So mm. what is there that's going to stop me doing what I need to do? Yeah. So for example, this morning, what was what would probably stop me if I didn't have a giant coffee times two? <laughs> and then on the flip side... Yeah, but that... Go on. No, I was just going to say that that actually, having a giant cup of coffee did nearly stop me lifting today when I spilled it on my laptop. So it works in both ways, but continue. But the laptop <laughs> is still working. Pardon? The laptop is still working though. No, I'm on the iPad now. Luckily, I've got backup. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Too many devices to handle. Yeah, like the prime. The prime thing for me was so with this like barriers to completion, like with turbo training, because I definitely spend a lot of time on Zwift. It's like, how do I? reduce that faffing so what I do is I live in a one bed flat it's quaint you can pretty much see half of it behind me <sighs> the other half is about the same size and that way and basically it's nice to yeah it's all right does the job yeah and um, yeah. I have my turbo trainer set up in the bedroom because what I normally do when I wake up in the morning straight on the turbo because it's literally, oh gosh, it's, it's that, that's brutal. Uh, I don't know, I'm used to it, so I don't really mind it. Oh, if I when I go to bed knowing that I have to get up and go straight on the trainer, I don't get a good night's sleep. I'm just almost dreading it, <laughs> dreading what's to come <laughs> because there's like no enjoyment before you get on the trainer, like, there's no enjoying a nice breakfast and having a coffee and watching the morning news and just relaxing into the day. It's just straight into his work. It's I just mean, a bit I, of a shock to the system. I always have a coffee first. Okay, I, that's not so I bad. Coffee, but like, it's, it's that, but it just reduces that bath time. Like, basically what I do is I get, I, I set up all the coffee, coffee machines so it's ready in the morning. So I just have to, I've got like a big filter machine. So I just go, press a button, let it all filter. Mm. There you go, coffee done. And so it's like, drink coffee, get on the turbo, let's go. Like, today is an exception. Where does breakfast come into it? Depends on what session it is. Breakfast comes in somewhere uh, in the coffee. But if it's like, today, it's like 45 minutes of just... Oh, that's all right then. Yeah, yeah get like, it done. Put a shit, put some shit TV on and just watch it for 45 yeah. minutes. There's normally tactics then, of an episode of something. <sighs> Great British Bake Off, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Youngest winner. Peter. Yeah. I haven't actually watched half the episodes. I've just been getting spoilers on social media. So I don't really have any reason to watch them now. I don't have any reason to catch up. <laughs> the I have watched, I haven't watched all of them, but I've watched uh, an assortment. And it's purely because I really, really enjoy... Uh, Matt Lucas and Noel Fielding's like bromance. Oh yeah. This is really sweet. I really like I really like Matt Lucas. 
when I was younger, we used to watch, like, <laughs> this is so bad, but my parents um, always used to watch Little Britain and we'd always watch as well. And I was just thinking a couple of weeks ago that would just not be allowed to, to air in 2020. <laughs> I know. I, know. I, uh, I I I rewatched it re in the like in the first lockdown. I was rewatching it, and I thought, oh, "There's so much of this that couldn't have, that couldn't have." Sorry, been. Oh my god! Yeah. At the time, I remember thinking, "That's a bit controversial," but like, I think it's just like society globally has wisened up to it a lot more. And now, yeah, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that. Yeah, really exactly. A lot of it, but it's terrible. You can still, it's still on. It's on Netflix, I think, in the UK. Is anyway. it in the UK? Maybe pretty... I'll have to catch up. Yeah, re rewatch. Have a refresher. Yeah, yeah. It is like I don't know. I remember at the time. Just how bad it is. Yeah, at the time I literally was thinking, "Fuck, that's extreme." And then now yeah. watching it, I was just like, "Holy shit!" And there's another series called. Um, I want to say it's called like Airport or something, which is oh, okay. David Williams and Matt Lucas as well. And it's all featured about yeah. like being in an airport effectively. And it's very similar to yeah. And flipping hell. Yeah. I think it's probably worse than some bits of Little Britain actually. Oh, I feel like I need to watch this one instead. They're always a troublesome combination. So I bet it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the characters that they recreate are... <laughs> Pretty spectacular. Yeah. 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 There's a few that I was, I, I watched it and I was just like, shit me, how have they done that again? It's just a prime example all the time, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what, um, what is the plan while you're back in New Zealand? So when I get out of my hotel room on Monday, mm -hmm. I'm going to Auckland. So that's where my brother lives. He studies um, at university in Auckland. So that'll be nice. I'll get to see him and I'll spend a few days um, at his flat. So <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that's all right. Um, but we're just doing, I've never ridden in, in Auckland before. So I'm just doing a bit of cruisy adventure style riding, I guess, just having fun on the bike. And then from there, we're actually going to a place in the North Island that I haven't we haven't really been before. I've only been there for like a fleeting visit and we're doing like a three day. I mean, I'd call it bike packing, but it's not. It's like the glam, it's like um, when you have glamping, like the glamorous camping, it's like the glamorous version of bike packing. Like we're, we're riding point to point, but there's a follow car and we're staying, <laughs> we're staying at Airbnbs and we have people taking our stuff. So it's just, it's like, 200k then 150 and then 130 um kilometers each day so it'll just be a nice adventure around an area we haven't seen before no scenery and then from there go back to it'll be my first time home since july um and then i get in at 6 p.m at night and then at 2 40 a.m the next morning i have the zwift world champs so that is just going to be a total shock to the system. Um, but yeah, we'll get that done. And then from there, I'll probably start to slowly resume some proper training, i.e. I'll actually follow what's on my training peaks and what my coach is giving me. And then, uh, yeah, we've got nationals in February. So that's the main aim, the main reason I'm in New Zealand and what I'll slowly build up for. And because to get free hotel quarantine you have to stay in New Zealand for three months so from the 14th from I landed on the 16th and I think nationals finishes on the 16th of February three months later so it's perfect really so then from there I'll slowly mosey my way back to Europe and just depending on what races I have coming up first and yeah when the calendar will start for me I'll head back over to Girona but it'll be a nice three months in summer uh, have Christmas here, have a nice family holiday. Haven't had one of those for a while. So it'll be quite a relaxing time, especially because normally I'd go and race in Australia, like at TDU or Cadell Evans, but those won't be a goer. So it'll just be a nice time in New Zealand, really. Yeah, they've been cancelled, haven't they? Which is, it's a real shame. 
because they're especially yeah. is fucking incredible like it's just yeah it was really cool yeah having the fact that you've got the base in adelaide and it all just spirals out from adelaide is is fantastic like it's really really good but mm. understandable why they've been cancelled it's good that the nationals are still going totally yeah 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 it's basically business as usual in new zealand covid although it's a thing on the news it's not really prevalent here all the cases are just in managed isolation in the hotels and you don't have to wear face masks and yeah it's very much life um as it was beforehand before covid struck besides from obvious obvious things like no tourists no flights coming in uh but yeah it'll be quite refreshing actually to get back to a place where you don't have this constant fear well not really a fear but just the unknown of a virus hanging over you and whether what what would happen if you get it like it like in spain it was rather common there and actually like as we were leaving um there were a few people close to me that were starting to get it so yeah it was starting to become a little bit iffy so to be back in new zealand would just be almost a weight off the shoulders really yeah it's so i was when it's funny, isn't it? Because I think we're, it's now been over a year since the first cases internationally. And I, so in... It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? But I was, so I was in Morocco in February and it was kind of like people were talking about it a little bit, but it was still, it was that thing that was, you know, it wasn't close to us. And then I went to, yeah. I went to Calpe in... March and ended up being stuck in Calpe because they put it to lockdown. And oh, yeah, there's not a lot to do in Calpe in lockdown. I can tell you that. Um, <gasps> there's not a lot to, to do in Calpe. Full stop. At the best of times. At the best, of, yeah. There's not a lot there anyway. So apart I mean, from riding a bike. Yeah, I mean the cycling's incredible, but I think the reason why the cycling's incredible is because there's nothing else to do basically. And um, yeah, I I then got back to the UK and Spain was a real was really badly hit and so was Italy as well and, mm. and now, now I think like the I don't know how the public perception is but in the UK it's a bit of a shit show and America obviously is, has been a complete shit show so mm. you have just done it really really have done it how everyone should do it like I've got one of my a really good friend of mine lives in New Zealand and she's we've been talking about it quite a lot and she's just like yeah it's kind of fine here like it's it's still talked about but we don't really have to worry because it's so mm, exactly um and it's, it's not like yeah every other country can just split themselves off though that's the thing it's the it's the island that helps the isolation <laughs> yeah i mean the uk is a freaking island and we still cock it up so well, that's very true, actually, yeah. yeah. Just shut yourselves off. Yeah, it's I mean... It's a bit late now, I think. That's what they want to do. Done. Brexit, Brexit, that's what they want to do. Yeah, you just need to make an island. That's <laughs> that's the way to go about it. So where my my, my uh, big chunk of my family's from the Isle of Man, and my dad, yeah. my dad still lives in the Isle of Man, and it's just they don't have any cases. They're in a very similar situation. Um, but on the flip side, it meant um, my so one of my sisters got married nearly a month ago. In fact, mm. yeah, pretty much a month ago, and I, I wasn't allowed to go because I'm I live in London, and oh. the the options I had they basically in the Isle of Man they basically just closed the border, and the option that I had was if I went out there I'd have to quarantine in a prison. Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, I, oh my I gosh. Like, I was talking to my dad about it and he was like, I mean, he, he literally was like, as much as I'd love you to come, I don't think you should quarantine in a prison. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I had to say, I probably agree with you there. <laughs> and um, yeah. How, how far is the Isle of Man from the UK in terms of like sea distance? Because I had this theory that if you were traveling to like New Zealand, for example, and you were on a boat and it took longer than two weeks, would that just take out the quarantine time? 
like, could you just use the quarantine time, but on a boat? So that could work. You could have just done like a self-supported travel to the Isle of Man, maybe in like a, a kayak with a little bit of cabin. You just paddle over there slowly over the course of two weeks. That could work. I mean, it's a ferry which takes a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, or a flight that takes... I mean, mm-hmm. the flight, literally, I think it just goes up, down. I think that's literally it. Oh. Yeah. Okay, maybe not then. If you did it in a kayak, you could probably, it'd probably take you two weeks. Yeah, and you could maybe just, like, go around Cornwall or something. Just go right around the UK. <laughs> the, um, just go the long way. <laughs> I mean, what we could do is I could get one of those, like, duck pedlo bikes. Cause it yeah, yeah that's bike. what I'm thinking. And also, yeah, true. Duck, duck pedalo bike, duck pedalo boat. That's one of those things. You know what I mean? Duck. Yeah, a pedal, a pedal boat. Yeah. As long as it's got a duck head on it, it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> in theory, could work. I think that's a good theory, though. If you are isolating, like you say, on a boat, maybe yeah. that's the way that travel is going to go. I mean, <laughs> we've, con- we've seen. You'd have to be solo on the boat, though, I think. Yeah. You couldn't have too many friends on the boat. Could yeah. be a cruise ship, that's for sure. Oh yeah, because if one person gets it, everyone's fucked, basically. Yeah, yeah. But no cruise ships. It's interesting, isn't it? Because like I've got friends that, who work in aviation, and they're like, they're all just like, yes, yeah, the whole aviation. They don't know what to do with themselves. Yeah, like the half of them have lost their jobs, and half of them are like, effectively, a lot of them are on zero hour contracts, so they don't. It doesn't really matter. Uh, to, I mean, the guys that are pilots are paid way too much money anyway, in my opinion. I'm gonna put it out there. <laughs> and so they're just kind of like, oh, well, I'm just going to ride my bike now. But then the, the, my friends who are like cabin crew, who lost their job, yeah. cabin crew like salaries really, really crap, which is the irony of the fact that they're the ones that are like the most customer facing person in the, you know, in the mm. aviation. And they're paid like, uh, like the equivalent of like I I don't know like well, it's basically minimum wage for a lot of them. But people don't realise is how highly trained cabin crew are like first responders basically. They have to be. Um, we get paid fuck all. Mm, and that's half, true. Yeah. Half of them have lost their jobs because of everything, and that's that's where it's a bit. Shy. And they have to look good as well. Unfortunately, that's part of the part of the job, which is a bit fucked up, I think. Um, mm. I don't know. I've got friends that work for BA and Virgin, and BA, from the gist I've heard, BA is a bit backwards, and Virgin's a bit more forward-thinking in the fact that uh, the girls don't have to wear high heels, for example. Mm, interesting. They're also allowed, the girls are also now allowed to wear trousers. Oh, that's the thing with Air New Zealand. Some of those flight attendants, they rock the trousers, yeah. Yeah, why not? It's comfortable, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got to be functional. I mean, that is that is a big part of it, isn't it? Form versus function, yeah? I used to, I used to, <laughs> I used to be an architect, so I completely get this. A skirt, to me, seems really unpractical. Exactly, yeah. I've never worn one, I will confess, so I can't <laughs> speak from experience. But it seems really unpractical. What's practical? Trousers and shorts. Fuck it, fuck it. Shorts are the most practical because there's less of them. So don't, because I get really annoyed with trousers and they're like tight on your legs. <laughs> this is like a stupid problem, but I get really annoyed with trousers. So I probably spend the majority of the year in shorts because it's more comfortable. But you can make it quite a good year to be. It's quite a good year to be into like loose fitting pants though. Fat pants. It's perfect. Don't own a pair. You don't need No. Oh. I know. How did you get through lockdown then if you don't have a pair of sweatpants? Shorts. <laughs> oh no. Everyone needs a pair of like long, fat, like two sizes too big pants to lie on the couch in. I literally don't own a pair. And um... I have this weird vendetta with like jogging 
bottoms or anything like that. I just, I think they're like, I don't know, I just really don't like them. I think they're the ugly. And so I've never, I've never owned a pair of jogging bottoms or sweatpants. Like, I've never owned a pair. So until I can find some that I think they look pretty cool, I'm not going to own a pair. And to be fair, Rafa bought some out and I was like, oh, Yes, I was about to mention those. They're I've been living in them. They the are Rafa knitted sweatpants. Yep. They're very good. Um, uh, yeah, they're the only ones I've seen. And I thought, yeah, they're actually quite good because they don't look that bad. The other thing that I also refuse to own is a hoodie. I hate hoodies. Oh, interesting. I don't own a hoodie. And I, I've got, obviously, I've got jumpers and stuff, but I don't own a hoodie. And the reason why, and it, it's a legit reason, is when I was like a teenager, it's just kind of, it's not a nice story, but I'm going to say it anyway. When I was a teenager, I got jumped on by a gang and beaten up, and they all had the hoods Oh, up. gosh. Yeah. And so since then, I've never, never owned a hoodie. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. That will put you off. Yeah. yeah. Although I do see the practical side of it, keeps your ears warm, but just don't want one. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, you can find other things to keep your ears warm. Beanies. Earmuffs. There are other ways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only next thing I could think of was earmuffs. So, what, um, so yeah, 2021. So you, you're going to end up coming back to Europe, you reckon, springtime. Yeah, I don't really know the seasons in terms of Europe. I'm still in New Zealand seasons, but I think like late February, March, is that spring, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, that's the end of summer for us, so. Yeah, you'll be going into autumn, we'll be going into spring. And like springs, I don't know, I like spring. I really like spring because it starts to get warm again and light again. But mm. I feel like it's going to be interesting to see what happens with racing next year because... I mean, there was a lot of women racing that was cancelled. There's tons. Mm. Yeah. Much more. And especially when you break your leg, it's quite slim pickings in the end. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> about you don't that. go to many races. Shit. How did that happen again? It was the day before Strada Bianchi, and we were reconning the course. But ironically, I, I crashed on the seal. I didn't crash on the gravel. <laughs> But it was just like a, a perfect corner. Like the road was smooth. It was a very like gradual sweeping bend. We were going a quarter of race speed. It wasn't even fast. And there just must have been something on the road. I'm thinking maybe there was an olive oil tree nearby and there was a bit of oil that it <laughs> was leaking out. I'm not sure because there was a team that crashed there the day before as well. But it was totally random. My bike just went from underneath me. And I just landed smack bang on the hip. So... Yeah, that cut out most of the races for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, I remember that now. That was, it feels like a long time ago, but it wasn't really that long ago. It was like three and a half months ago. Yeah. yeah. How, how are you feeling now? Yeah. Like, all recovered? Pretty good. Yeah, I've just still got a few niggly issues. Like one side doesn't feel quite as strong as the other. And I think I sit quite lopsided on the bar now mm. like I don't think I sit with equal bum cheek on the seat <laughs> but yeah no all got it's it's all going well really um all things considered um, say, yeah it's just a few a few little issues I have to work on yeah would you say that, that is that like do you think that's the worst injury you've had oh for sure yeah I've broken my collarbone twice and that in comparison I would say it's like scratching your knee <laughs> the femur was just so painful and it's taken so long. Whereas a collarbone, you can be back riding on the road within a week and a half. Although you shouldn't be, but you can. Yeah. And it doesn't hurt that much when you break it. No, the thing I is, don't know. Some, someone else out there might have had a painful collarbone, but my yeah. two times haven't been that bad. And they were quite comprehensive breaks. So. Wasn't it um, Matt Heyman broke his collarbone and just did all his training on Zwift and then one Harry Oh, back. that was his wrist. Was it his yeah. wrist? I knew it was something that yeah. meant he could still train in, so, inside. But like, yeah, I, 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 these two, they're still here. They're still intact. Look, still normal looking. Haven't broken a collarbone yet. Touch wood. 
Oh, you better touch some wood, yeah. Got a wooden desk. It's a good club to join, though. It's, it's a classic cyclist club. But yeah. that actually, speaking of Matt Heyman, that's very impressive, the fact that he won Harry Roubaix with a broken wrist. Like, I haven't really thought about that before, but to be able to hold the bars for over 200k doing, yeah, that's, that's impressive. Yeah. I it's remember, not just the training. It's like the actual being able to get through the course. I mean, yeah, I, I remember watching it and thinking, nah, he's not going to win this. And then going, holy fuck, he is. And it was like, it was just really nice to see because it was like, there was a massive, like, flood of emotion from him, which is like, oh, always, yeah. I really like that when you actually see, I don't think we see it enough in professional sports, not just cycling, all professional sports where people actually get that emotional. And that was one where he was really, really overcome with emotion at the end of it. Mm. Like, it was one for the good guys. Yeah, exactly. It was one that, you know, I mean, I'm trying to think who else was like favorite that year. Tom Boonen probably was. It sounds like this right kind of era. Um, yeah, it almost feels like we're going back in time a little bit. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm in the past. Tom Boonen, that's sort of almost a name from the past now. It's quite bizarre to think about, but... Yeah, Tornado Tom. Great, great nickname. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, what was... Would you have... If Paris Roubaix did happen this year, would you have been planning to race it? No. No. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> <Like> that. <laughs> no way. I mean, it would be nice to do, wouldn't it? Just to say you've done it, but... It's not really my sort of thing. Not my cup of tea. It's it's one of those it's one of those races, isn't it, that I can imagine as a professional to tick it off is one you'd love to tick off. Yeah, but to actually go through it, being the type of rider that I am, doesn't really suit my physiology, so or my body type. So to do it would be quite awful. But yeah, it would be nice to say I've done it. <laughs> You're just gonna be bouncing around on some tombstone cobbles basically for a, a day. <laughs> yeah. And it's not exactly the sort of race that the team would put me in for unless six or seven riders or the ha half the roster were, uh, were sick and injured. Yeah. It, would be, it would be a very desperate move. It's, um, I remember, I can't remember when it was, but it's quite a few years back, Mark Cavendish did it. And it's not, I mean, you could, you could argue it could suit him as a sprinter, but um, he did it purely because he wanted to do it and say he'd done it. And on the, hmm. on the like, on the flip side, when you, it was at Flanders a few years ago as well, like Nibali rode it, and everyone was just like, "Okay, this is strange." But actually, yeah, thing, wanted to ride it to have done the experience of it, and the fact that there was going to be a women's Roubaix this year, literally, it was the race that I was like, "It's fucking awesome! I'm well excited for this." And then obviously, it all got yeah. Going. I just really, really hope. It would it would have been really cool to watch. Oh, it would have been amazing. And I really, really, really hope that it does happen next year. Yeah. Yeah, I think if the men's one happens, the women's one will happen. But, you know, who knows what's happening next year? Nobody right. knows. <laughs> so we'll just have to wait and see. So what... Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is what's your opinion on a women's tour de France? I bet you've been asked this before. <laughs> well, I think it would be nice to have an event that's branded as the Women's Tour de France, but it can't be the same as the Men's Tour de France. I think as far as marketing and branding goes, that's where the similarities should end, basically. Because mm -hmm. women's racing is different than, different than men's racing, and it's a good difference. Like, the races are nowhere near as long. They're dynamic. They're exciting. And to be completely honest with the way that females race, I don't think that we'd be able to handle at least 20 days consecutively. Well, albeit with the rest days. Just because the racing is, is so much. It's brutal. And in the Tour de France stages, you see them and they're tapping along or so, and then the race really towards but there's a lot of just mucking around at times and just waiting and waiting for a point where the fireworks will finally go off whereas in women's racing because 
the distances are so much shorter it's always on from the get-go and it's a lot more animated and that's why people like women's racing as well that's why that's like the selling point and I think you shouldn't be changing that so I'd like to see a women's tour de France I'd like to see it under the same marketing but maybe 10 days and the stages certainly don't need to be anywhere near as long as the men's racing Um, maybe even 130 kilometers max really I, I mean, I agree with you. Like, it just, as you say, the marketing and branding of it should be the same. And there's no, I have no issues with it being like held at the same time of the year. Like, that's I think that's also fine. But the problem with it being held mm. at the same time of the year is you've got the Giro Rosa. Like, it straight up just becomes that's where it becomes an issue. But then that's yeah, like status, hasn't it, for next year? Because it's not UCI World Tour next year, no. And I think. Yeah, deservedly so, unfortunately, that it's had its uh, ranking stripped, its classification, because it just, it wasn't up to the standards that a grand tour for women should be. So maybe a Tour de France can be introduced and that replaces the gravity and the magnitude that the Giro is seen at. And then the Giro can then become maybe a lower level event for teams can roster it like a B squad or more like a preparation race for other races not seen as the pinnacle of the year for women's because obviously it's hard because you can't have too many big races because the squads aren't as big as the men's race uh the men's teams like the men's teams have up to 30 riders whereas the biggest teams are women's racing I think maybe ours like we've got 16 riders and that's definitely one of the biggest and by the time you have injuries and sickness, you can't have too many squads going at once or going back to back. So we, we from that it, point of view. We completely saw it this year with how like compacted the racing season was for men and women that even the men were struggling. Oh, it was, it was crazy. Like the you know, you yeah. like you know, someone would be doing one minute would be doing, I don't know, one of the, the grand tours, the next minute, literally it felt like the next minute they're at a a classic race and then the next minute they're at another grand tour and like having spoken to a few men who were racing like I was chatting to Alex Dowsett about it and he was just like I'm mm-hmm. exhausted like it, it was a hard year really really hard year yeah I, I read somewhere it was something like it was something like some crazy number of days of racing like a hundred days of racing shoved into like 50 days mm. yeah that and that's across men's and women's and like that that's just bonkers like the squads aren't can't cope with that as you as you've already alluded to the women's squads are a lot smaller and uh, you know to be mm. for that much racing in such a short period of time fuck is is crazy i mean we're very lucky that we managed to get as much racing as we did to be perfectly honest so one of the i guess a strength mm. weakness of cycling is that because it's outside and it's an outdoor sport you could in theory manage to hold quite a lot of the races and it but the i guess one of the weaknesses of it is is you're kind of restricted by i mean people are still going to go out onto the climbs and you can't really stop it i guess to some extent like mm, exactly the, yeah the grand tours where the climbs are still crowded with people i mean it was definitely more noticeable that it was less but it was very clear mm. that still like big groups of people around I mean, yeah, some of those days of the Tour de France were a little bit iffy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and and same in the Vuelta, same in the Giro, and I don't know. It's part. It's a weird learning curve, isn't it? Like, I, I always, I always try and I try and think in my head like, what's like, what's a way that we can work out a way? Because with cycling, you don't really have it as a venue-based sport unless you look at track cycling, and I. Mm. I love track cycling i love watching it I, I like the six day series is brilliant it's just good fun party vibe but how mm. do you work out a way of like increasing revenue and i don't i don't know the answer i don't think anyone really knows the answer like in my head track cycling logically should be that way but it doesn't really i don't know it just doesn't equate in the same way it's not as popular as like the grand tours quite frankly it's yeah tri- it's, it's a tough one hmm. especially <laughs> with road cycling being free to spectate it's just (laughs) it's it's like 
I think it's one of the one of the biggest issues really when it comes to road cycling, unfortunately. Especially yeah. with trying to grow women cycling. It's like, well, you can't charge spectators to watch unless it's on TV, which I guess is a good thing in two thousand and twenty and two thousand and twenty one, but ideally people want to be out on the road watching, so Yeah, definitely you're not getting that revenue. I've always I definitely would prefer to watch races in person than on TV. Even for me, it's always like I try and go out to Flanders like every year because I just fucking love that race. Mm. And I go there on, the, I'd normally go out there on the Saturday when everyone's doing the sport eve, watch the pros on the Sunday and then ride the route on the Monday because my logic, and I think it's pretty sound, is that <laughs> the road You can collect free bottles. Well, you could get the roads are generally closed still on large proportions of it on the Monday because they've got a strip out oh. so most of it you can still ride about traffic and there's not a wave of a thousand people trying to ride the climbs or certain sections which you guarantee you're gonna have to stop on and I've done that in the last couple of years and it is it's worked so the logic was yeah. Good. Yeah. but um yeah. yeah, that's not so bad. Yeah, and like going out there and actually watching races is like you get the atmosphere, you can see like the pain on the faces and, you know, really see people giving it their mm-hmm. I mean, you do get that on the TV and like the TV coverage generally is amazing. We're, we're very lucky to be able to get such good mm. the riders through TV, whether that's like through, you know, Eurosport and the GCN app or whatever it is that you're watching it. Like, but yeah, it, you know, it does get... I do get a bit nervous at times when you see how close like the motorbikes get. I'm just like, because yeah. most of the times they're not on a zooming lens or anything. They're literally like that close, you know? Exactly. Especially in like uh, Milan San Remo when they're going down the, fi- down the final descent. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Even just watching the riders and that was just too much. Mm. Oh, so, so dodgy. So what, um... But then I do get, I get frustrated with some of the commentators as well. So, Carlton I don't Kirby. like. I don't like many of them. Pardon? Carlton Kirby. Oh yes. <laughs> oh man, I was getting so sick of him. Oh, oh he's the worst. I mean, sorry, I'm, Carlton, but yeah. I'm sure he's a You're really nice guy. Way. Yeah, I'm sure he's a really nice guy in person. But I, I'm the same. I can't stand his commentary. Oh. He just suddenly, he'd be like, "Whoa!" and you're like, "Are you alright?" <laughs> Okay, you, something you've got a bit overexcited, and he's very, he's, very nervous, isn't he? Whenever it's wet, he just loves the sound of his voice. Oh my! Yeah, God. I really like Rob Hatch though. Rob yeah. Hatch is my favourite. I like yeah. him. I'm with you. And Matt Stevens, obviously, but so that's quiet. Oh, well, you cut out then. What did I finish with? Matt Stevens was the last I heard. <laughs> yeah, you can't ha- you can't hate Matt Stevens. That's what I was saying. <laughs> you could hate his hair. Nah, actually, it's pretty special. <laughs> his lock his lockdown here. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's 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 weird. Like I don't know, Carlton Kirby is probably now one of the most iconic cycling commentators. Like everyone kind of knows his voice, but also mm. his re- he. Uh, I, I always think. The reason what frustrates me about him is that he tells really bad dad jokes. Yeah. And I feel that he often overreacts to things in the race. Like, mm. like, like. They make the, you have a mini heart attack while you're on the couch. <laughs> exactly. It could be a slightly tighter corner, or it could be a motorbike that is close, but it's kind of fine. Or I think he's probably yeah. seen so much, isn't he? I guess it's probably why the reactions are like he's already like he's already like all the interviews. Yeah, it's true. It's gonna come, it's gonna happen. Yeah, but I've, I've never he's got met a bit of PTSD there. Yeah. yeah, I've never met him. I'm sure he's a really lovely guy. But yeah, I'm with you, Rob Hatch. He's the one. He's definitely the mm. one. Yeah, and yeah. Look. He deserves a promotion. Yeah. He needs Carlton's spot. I feel like Carlton's the top dog, and he's been there too long. He's like the mafia, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's time to go, Carlton. <laughs> so, one of the things that I I definitely pre warned you this, didn't I? One of the things I always ask towards the end of podcasts is for five 
life hacks, top tips. Oh, yes. Yes, you did pre me. I wrote a list, actually. I had to find it. I'm, I'm impressed. So I, 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 sometimes I pre-warm people when I feel like I'm being nice, but sometimes I don't. And I'm glad I did. <gasps> because the times that I haven't pre warned people, I've normally got a very, like, you fucking dickhead kind of response. <laughs> I did a podcast with a guy who works for Ceramic Speed earlier this week. And I saw, I pre-warned him, but I didn't pre-warn him that much, if that makes sense. Like I sort of said, oh, I'll probably talk about this at some point. And he was like, yeah. Oh. And I literally was like, come on then, five points. And he was just like, oh. <laughs> Bring them out. Yeah. And he was, same thing, he's like, I've written a list. <sighs> but then, go on, hit me with number one. I'm ready. So, so it's almost, you almost get a bonus one, actually. Um, but it is to always um, have peanut butter. Well, first of all, actually, you always have porridge for breakfast. You always have oats. Oats is just the breakfast of choice. I think you can't go wrong. It's like the pinnacle of breakfast. And you've always got to have peanut butter or some form of nut spread on your porridge. Like it's just, it just makes that. I, I do not understand people who don't have like a nut butter, especially peanut butter on the porridge like if you don't have nut butter on hand you could have kala if you speculate the healthiest compared to a nut butter but they still do the job so yeah that's that's life hack number one you've just you've just got to have I, the nut butter on there yeah. you agree uh, i don't need to say i literally yeah 100 i the problem i have is i <laughs> can't have a lot of whatever it is, peanut butter, whatever type of nut butter it is, I can't have a lot of it in my house because I will eat it with a spoon out the jug. I love oh, it. And oh, I'm, true. That's my mm. problem. But 100% in porridge, oh, so good. So good. Mm. Um, What's your favourite brand of um, peanut butter? Uh, what do you I go really, for? I really like uh, Pippa Nut. Do you know them? Oh, yes. Yes, like, pepper nut is very good. Yeah, I like, I like the taste of it, and I also like that they're like they don't use palm oil, and I like that you can buy it in kilo tubs. Yes, I have one of those in Girona. Yeah, the kilo tub from Wiggle. Yeah, and they also do um, sachets, which you can take for riding. Oh, they um, you know, Pix peanut butter. They have that as well in New Zealand. You can get what they call like the peanut butter slugs. So they're just sachets of peanut butter. That and that's so good. Pick slugs. <laughs> yeah, I... What's that? Slug is a great name for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it literally is a slug. <laughs> I just squeeze now and it, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm 100% with you with peanut butter. Like, I, I fucking love it. I fucking love it. Crunchy mm. or smooth, though? I'm smooth only because it goes on really well to porridge. It's better than crunchy and like function wise. That's why I go with smooth, but crunch, I do, I do enjoy a bit of texture. So it's just one of those compromises though. I'm just, yeah, I'm compromising function over, well, texture over function. Yeah. I had, um, <laughs> I, what do you think of Reese's Pieces peanut butter cups? I can't say I've had much of them, unfortunately. I might have had one in my life when I was in America. But yeah, you, you only really find them in the international aisle here and they're probably like $10 for one. So it's not the sort of thing I gravitate towards. They, uh, I'm obsessed with them. I'm obsessed, literally obsessed with them. So that you can buy like, I have some in my fridge. You can buy like a <gasps> pack that's like this sort of shape. There's a long rectangle. Oh, okay. Oh, I know the ones, yeah. Three cups in it that are like, I don't know, a good circle size. But they also make like a grab bag of mini ones. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that, that's normally that. I just go with, normally I just go with lint chocolate with a good dollop of peanut butter on there. That's pretty oh. tasty. That, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good, that's a good dessert snack. Yeah. I normally find it, it just fulfills my peanut butter fix for the evening, so... It's it's pretty solid. That, that actually though, I have a. Go on. 
I have a big addiction to salt. Like I just love salt on anything and everything. And I love the um, the Vegemite peanut. Is it Vegemite? No, Marmite peanut butter that you can get in the UK. Oh, it's amazing. Really? It's just awesome. extra salty peanut butter. They've made yeah. a, oh, so good. They've made a Marmite hummus. What's your stance on that? Oh, a Marmite hummus? Yeah. No, 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 no. See, I like Vegemite anyway, so I'm actually, a, I'm a Vegemite gal, so <laughs> I wouldn't eat Marmite straight, and in hummus, I feel like it would be a bit too strong. It's not good in hummus. Although, if it tastes like the peanut butter, then it would be okay. Mm. So, I can't imagine it would be. But then actually, okay, so I have a further point for the peanut butter, and that is that... It's basically, you just, you can't be scared of having too much of that sort of thing. Because when you're training, like you burn so many calories and sometimes you might think to yourself, oh, I shouldn't have that little extra piece or I shouldn't have that. But really, you don't realize just how much you're burning and you can't really afford, well, you can't afford to skimp. It's like your body just needs it. So there's no point just trying to cut out certain things or trying to reduce the portion. So just have like a massive dollop of it because it doesn't really matter. And because if you're training reasonable amount, then it's really going to touch the sides of... That's my second point for, on peanut butter. Like it's calorie dense, but... It doesn't really matter at the end of the day because if you're a reasonably serious cyclist and you're training a lot, then your body needs it. So people, need it. people often, I think cycling has a really bad relationship with weight. Just the nature of the sport, like you go uphill. Yeah, fast. it's terrible. But it's really, really bad. And as someone, like I used to be my biggest, I was 120 something kilos. I was big. I was really big. And that's yeah i'm not gonna lie that's quite big <laughs> a large human being that um and at the moment i put <laughs> around 78 79 kilos which for me now is that's quite big for mm. me. Like, when i'm probably i guess lightest I'm probably, i probably i can't go any lighter than sort of 75 if i get to much lighter like my power just drops through a cliff so mm. i found out what that like power to weight like tipping point is for me is basically anything like 75 kilos but cycling has such an, a dangerous and volatile relationship with food it just it really does mm. i feel like it's getting better but and I, the reason why i feel like it's getting better because we're starting to see more diversity in size of people riding mm. in both the women's and the men's side of the sport like it's starting to become much more noticeable that, that, you know, that there are different people who are better at different things, et cetera, et cetera. But as you say, you burn so many calories when you're riding a bike, much more than people think. And then what you have to remember is that there's always, you still need to eat the amount of calories that you need to, to like day to day on top of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just your metabolic resting calories. Yeah. People forget that. So you end up like, yeah. you might get a lot of people that sit there and they, they, you know, they will end up scrimping on something on a, after a big ride and they end up binge eating into the evening because they've not eaten properly during the ride, for example. Mm, exactly. Yeah. I feel like for majority of cyclists, it's not like everyone has an eating disorder per se, but for the majority, their eating is not intuitive. It's, it's disordered. And I think, it's just important to just, you know, look at the bigger picture and just think past the fact that, oh, I can't have that because then I won't be able to ride up the hill fast and I'll put on weight because it's just ridiculous. Like, you train so much. There's no point in just not having an extra cookie or not treating yourself because really you're not even going to notice it on the scales. It's just going to go straight through you. And I saw an article that came out the other day 
that made me so it made me a little bit annoyed. It was from um, Remco talking about his recovery and how he was so afraid of putting on weight when he broke his pelvis and now he's dropped five kgs. And it's just I don't know if it's just a Belgian old school mentality, but it just seemed bizarre. Like it just seemed like he was back five, ten years ago. Yeah. It just it just seemed unusual for like a young rider coming through to be talking about dropping five kgs when he's coming back from injury and trying to rebuild like i don't know it's just not really the sort of thing that should be coming out in the media these days i agree it's that there's definitely like a, a european mentality to it that's very different than a lot of the rest of the world like when i say yeah europe, I mean like italy belgium france yeah just the Spain. classic traditionalist yeah and it's not yeah. I mean, I, interestingly, like we look at uh, how I think about it is you look at, so let's look at in my head, the Giro, when Ghana, who is like, was the heaviest man <gasps> in the peloton, and he goes and wins a freaking mountain stage. He defies gravity, he defies logic as well. Yeah, which is, yeah, fair enough. Like, and also, it's good to see. It's good to see. And also, I know also on the, the flip side of it as well, keeping on that theme is like, you look at the likes of like Wout wow, Van Aert. He's a big guy. He's a big guy. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's big. He's a strong guy, but he's a big build, like big frame, massive. Mm -hmm. on him. He's not a conventional cyclist. I think part of the problem is is that often when we watch bike racing, and you quite often watch the stages which are like the mountainous stages because they're the ones that are like really interesting to watch. Like if you were like a. Yeah. You, know, you didn't follow the sport massively and who wins the mountain of stages it's normally like the, the 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 person who is more of a climber build and so yeah i feel like part of a you know unconsciously maybe people instantly think that's what cyclists looks like but cycling is for all shapes all sizes all ethnicities you know whatever it is that you are who you are it's pretty easy to ride a bike. I've got a mate who mm -hmm. uh, he's in a wheelchair and he's got a hand bike and he rode up Stelvio. I've seen him on YouTube actually. <laughs> Another one. Good old Justin. <laughs> he's got the best voice in the world as well. I know. <laughs> I was about to say the voice. <laughs> so deep. So deep. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we've completely gone off topic of the the points. Where were we? Did we get the first? I can bring another one in. Go on, bring another one in. Um, my thing for 2020, always carry a book with you. That's so my friend Hannah from the teammate, she got me a book for my birthday in July, and I hadn't finished a book since maybe I was 12, high school. Like I honestly couldn't remember the last time I'd finished a book, and I had certainly hadn't read a book um, since then. And she got me this book and I was like, wow, I'm going to have to read it now. It's got a pretty cover. It looks interesting. So I finished the book and then I just, I'm just in reading now and I always have a book with me. And every time I finish a book, I treat myself and I go to a bookshop and then I choose another book with a pretty cover and then I just sell a new one. And I think I've been through maybe, I haven't been through that many, six books maybe, but yeah. it's just a new thing I like to do just to take time out from technology lie in the bed, read a book after writing. It's just, it's nice because technology is just taking over and sometimes it gets a bit exhausting and just to read a nice paperback book, smell the pages, it's great. So I, I, I agree with you, but I have a slight clause to what you're saying. I, so I'm very dyslexic. So my clause is that I always have a notebook and I use it for drawing because you've just taken probably my third point now <laughs> you've stolen it okay go on what's the third point <laughs> well my third point is to have to invest in a really good diary and one you one you actually want to write in and then every night maybe before dinner like set a good time that you always write in your diary so you get it done and you write exactly what you, what you want to do for the next day just the small things so you get to tick off more things like doing your core, doing your morning stretching. Even You can even tick off breakfast. You can, you can tick off emailing people, going to the supermarket. You just write down exactly what you want to get done. And it's just, it's great. I started doing it in lockdown 
Um, and I just found it made me so much more productive. And yeah. I just, yeah, I haven't stopped doing it. It's great. I've heard a lot good diary. do that kind of thing as a lockdown project. And it's really helped with structuring people's days. And I, I do something similar. So for me, I my, so my background is architecture. So I have a, a bookshelf full of old notebooks and sketchbooks and stuff full of them. And I'm very particular with the oh, notebooks. Nice. I, I generally will buy like moleskin books because I just think they're beautiful. But then this one was one I was given. Ooh, yeah. And I, if I get given them, I use them. That's I, cool though. Yeah, like I always feel like if you get given one, you have to use it still. So for yeah, me, you've got to find a purpose for it. Yeah, I, I, I write lists like there's no tomorrow as well. But I, for me, it's a creative outlet, a sort of outlet as well, because as I say, I'm dyslexic. Mm. So I don't like um, words, pretty standard, but I doodle. So it's a really good opportunity for me to like doodle ideas and thought processes and stuff like that. And to be perfectly honest, I'm trying to find a, an example of a really good doodle. They're never, they're never like, they're never good. Like in a in a doodle book, they're not good doodles. They're just like sprawls, like as you can kind of see. No, they don't have to be. Yeah, it's just sprawls of scribble, but it doesn't need to be. Yeah. How you portray an idea, quite literally. Um, it's just a good outlet. Exactly. So I'm I'm 100 percent with you on the whole idea of uh, having a diary or a doodle book. Like I think it's something that a lot of people don't realise how good to have that outlet is, and also to give yourself. Yeah. And obviously you can write lists and that sort of thing on your phone, but you just it's just nice to use a pen and paper because you use your phone and your laptop and your iPad and all sorts of devices so much that it's good to have a book to read and a diary to write in and just not to forget, not to forget how to actually use pen and paper. Yeah. It's like, I also think that there's something about looking at a screen or working on a screen that just doesn't comprehend well with our minds while as you say pen and paper i don't know for me anyway i guess i get less headache it feels more productive yeah 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 you know it's it's making marks that are kind of permanent well yeah a laptop or whatever it is that you can just save it and hide it it's gone you know it's gone into yeah. the space land it feels like you're concentrating more as well. Like you're actually more focused on, on a piece of paper. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah. That's three. We've got two more. <laughs> um, this is another 2020 thing. Bar bags. I love having a bar bag. It's yeah. so good. I just hate having things in my pocket. Like if I've got an extra tube jiggling around or my pump. You just put it in your bar bag and forget about it and your pockets are free and you're going up a climb and you're off your seat and you don't notice anything jumping about so yeah that's that's one of my things for this year it's very much a trendy thing but it's worth it it's not a fad it's uh i agree with you the 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 fact that most of them now there's so many brands that have done it and most of them are just really easily accessible uh i have one conveniently yeah. <laughs> one here it's a nice size oh yes that's good good. nice little uh round one uh, yeah that's nice the key is is that it's got to have a strap that goes around the oh, what is it the head tube one of them yeah 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 see i have one that doesn't and it just bangs about so that's a little bit annoying yeah so this one's got these little um vole straps vole i think that's what they're called. oh very good yeah which are my one of my bike packing tips by Vole strap because they, they're normally mm. like about that long and they're orange, but they're so freaking stretchy. Like when I rode across, oh. when I rode across Australia last year, um, I had a couple of Vole straps and I was literally just using them like to tie water bottles, like extra water bottles, to the bike. Just mm -hmm. the going, whoop, like that and they just clip in <laughs> those those little ones are like um they're pretty good and i don't think they're as good as the big ones because the big ones are like really like almost like rubbery so they kind of grip to themselves really well oh, okay yeah uh, but as a way of being able to fasten like a handlebar bag it's pretty perfect because like some mm. my only hesitance with bar bags is always um 
as you say, if you don't have the bit that goes towards the head tube, they can end mm. up on the head tube really bad and it just looks yeah. But Yeah, and I like to have secure straps as well because I've had like a few um, just nightmare thoughts run through my head, like if I'm descending and then one of the <laughs> one of the straps comes undone if I hit like a pothole and it ends in my wheel and I'm just down. Done that. <laughs> oh, it's my yeah. worst nightmare. I did it. Uh, I had a I did it off road though. Oh, that's no, that's still it shouldn't happen. I, it should never happen. This was this was before bar bags were trendy. Um, oh, okay, that's all right then. Yeah, it was a bit more of a prototype. Yeah, it, well, I won't say what brand it was, but basically, the clip broke and it just went like that onto the front oh. wheel and uh, I one, basically one of the clips broke and um, the whole front bag just fell off. I was in, I was in Kyrgyzstan, which is uh, not a place. Oh yeah, as you. Yeah, as you, as you, it's not a place. <laughs> as where, you go there, yeah. yeah. It's not where you want your bar bag to break. Um, no. But I had, I had some cable ties, just cable, cable tied all together. Uh, but uh, yeah, pretty scary. Especially because I was mm. like, proper bike packing and everything was like loaded on the bike and I had a lot on the bars and I was like shit oh yeah I guess that's probably less likely to happen if you've just got a snack and a tube and a pump in your front you don't have like half your wardrobe <laughs> yeah definitely definitely and yeah. a pair of shoes yeah yeah it depends <laughs> on the size of your feet <laughs> true because I can definitely not fit a pair of shoes in a bar bag no, 100% not. No, no. Some of them are like TARDISes, though. You don't quite realise how much you can fit in there. And you start packing them and you're like, oh, I can put, like, my arm warmers in here. I can put my vest. I can put a picnic. <laughs> They're great. That's a... They, I mean, they are probably... And I do think, like, for general riding, as a... I'm looking at a bike while I'm thinking about it. As a general, like, bag to add on to your bike. They are good, definitely. I must mm. prefer like a frame bag because as you say, when you're with a frame bag, you do end up with it like rubbing on your knees and stuff like It's really irritating. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And actually I like it as a form of resistance training <laughs> because you have it on the front and it feels quite bulky when you're riding and then you take it off or you go to a race and you don't have it on and you feel like you're flying. You've got like an extra 5% in you. So when you, next, next race, you're going to have a bar bag kind of snacks, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, I have the bar bag with the snacks for the for the entirety of my training, and then when I get to the race, I don't have it, so I'll be flying. I guess you have uh, someone at the side of the road just in case you need any spares. Yeah, it's it's almost like training with like a, a brake that's rubbing slightly. You yeah. take it off, you you remove it, and then you just <laughs> full steam ahead. <laughs> uh, that's a good tip. That one, I like that one. Very. Um, very logical. And it's definitely a 2020 thing, isn't it, bar bags? Yes, yes. Become very popular. It's like the trendy thing to have. Yeah, definitely. Right. Although one point to note, actually, is that I got a raffle one when I was in Australia um, at like the TDU pop-up. And then my teammates saw that I got one and they were like, oh, they're really cool. So then the next day they had them as well, except they're a lot shorter than me and their bikes are a lot smaller and they didn't stop to think that they wouldn't actually fit on their bikes. <laughs> so they had these bar bags, but their head, but the space between their wheels and their bars was so minimal that they couldn't actually fit one. Oh uh, yeah. Cause it starts rubbing on the front wheel. Or you can't even fit it in there. <laughs> oh really? Wow. Yeah. Depending if you've got like an aero bike, then yeah, there's well, no room. The other thing, my other, issue with bar bags is and, it, and I generally ride with one on my gravel bike which has got flared handlebars but mm. on, on su if you've got a larger one on a general road bike if you ride quite a narrow handlebar it really limits the space I'm, on this side I have a road bike and this side I have a gravel bike and <laughs> that's why I keep going like that so on the road bike it <laughs> limit like the uh, amount of room where you can actually put your hands I find. Mm, with that's true. Bike, yeah. With the bars, it's definitely. I, I know. I, the you know gravel bike. The bars I've got on my gravel bike are slightly wider than I would ride on the road, and they're flared. So 
especially with like when I did Australia and I did that on a gravel bike with flared handlebars and had a bigger handlebar bag than the one I just showed you. Mm. Uh, it's whenever I, I mean, there's very rare occasions I'd go on the drops riding across Australia, but it is that like, <laughs> You, Aero like, games. Yeah, I mean, it's freaking straight and flat. So sometimes on the Nullarbor. <laughs> let's not talk about that. That was, <sighs> that was a horrible, horrible day. Um, but like, there's points where you, you know, just to like change your position, you're going to want to go in the drops. And there's points where I'd be finding that my thumbs would be sitting right on the bag, and it was really irritating. But mm, yeah. Generally, I'm, I'm completely with you. I think they're a great addition. And there's so now there's so many different variations of sizes and brands out there. Like you can get really little ones. And, yeah. And like the size of a freaking the bike itself. Bags for all occasions. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> fifth point. You've kind of smashed it so far. Um, my fifth one. Um, uh, always have a hobby, aside to cycling, mm. because. Cycling is just, it's quite all encompassing and you just, sometimes you just need something else to take your mind off it. Even if you're not a completely serious cyclist, you need something else going on as well. It's like my, my brother at the moment, actually, he crashed and he crashed a couple of weeks ago and he was mildly concussed and his bike was quite badly damaged. So it's been in the shops for a few days and he's just finished uni. So he doesn't have anything to really do right now. And he's just hanging around and he sends a message today and he's like, I just want something else to do. My bike is just my life. Like I have literally nothing else going on in my life. Yeah. So he needs something else to do. So that's why I say you just, you need like another extra thing that you can just take your mind off cycling with. What's your hobby? Well, I like to bake sometimes, cooking, um, I learn, I try and learn Spanish. Obviously I've got my uni going on, so I study. Um, but when I'm not studying, when uni's not on, then I don't have that, but it keeps me pretty busy for, for most of the time, especially when it's during the season and I've had a shit training session, then <laughs> I can go home and do something else. I can go and do a Spanish exam or something. It's definitely good to have distractions away from the sport. Because, yes. like you say, it can become very all-encompassing because as a, as a sport, it's one that takes up... It's an endurance sport. It takes up time, a lot of time. That's why it ends up taking yeah. up time. And, I mean, I know, like, for when I've been, like, training for, like, long-distance time trials and stuff, that, you know, you might go out for a 10-hour ride and it's like, fuck it. And that might be a couple of times a week. And it's just like, yep, that's... This is my life. It's, yeah. Riding a time trial bike for half a day, great. And um, but then yeah, exactly. Additional things like like for me, I fucking love baking, and I went on a bread mm -hmm. course last year, and literally changed my life on how to make bread. It's incredible. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, highly recommend it. When they're open again, E Five Bakehouse in East London, bread baking course, brilliant. <laughs> I plug it to the to the cows come home because it's such a good course and oh and that sounds like my sort of thing yeah but what's so good about it, so you go there and you learn how to make uh, a rye bread bagels a sourdough loaf a focaccia and there's something else I can't remember what the other one is oh my gosh how long are you there for like a week day. it's a full on day but it's really like yeah and you get breakfast lunch and dinner there and oh that's a bonus it, and it's the breakfast is like uh, like it's all examples like samples of things they make there because they make their own flour mm -hmm. they make all their own cakes and stuff so breakfast is basically an assortment of bread and cakes lunches bread cakes and salads and dinner is bread cakes and salads basically so you're so full by the end of the day anyway because of the amount of food you made and then you end oh, up this sounds like heaven and then you end up with two like bags huge bags full of everything of you bread made. yeah oh Wow, carb heaven. Yeah, oh, so good, so good. This sounds great. The course itself was like really interesting. The guy that did it was just like a really nice guy and he got a little, um, I don't know what it is, but they, they give you like a little cookbook at the end of all the recipes in, all the ingredients in. Oh. Yeah. So that sounds good. perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 
so good so so good i like i it's a it's a bakery that i've been going to for years anyway and i and i, and I knew they did a baking like a bread making class of course they do it for like they do like an assortment of different courses but i didn't i was like ah, i'm not gonna go to that and then i was just like fuck it i'm gonna go i went in march and that was incredible really. mm, just before lockdown you got in there perfect timing yeah, it was like you knew that sourdough was going to be the bread of the year, so you thought, oh, better get some extra extra preparation, some training. I was in the future for a small period yeah. and realised it was a good idea. Um, you made bread before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before everyone else started making bread, I was making bread. Um, yeah. But yeah, like definitely, I definitely think having something like that. And the other thing for me is I paint. I do a lot of painting. I love painting. Mm. Um, yeah, that's cool. And I don't think, um, I don't know, I do that because that was like something which I used to do as a kid. And when I studied, it was a lot of my, when I studied architecture, a lot of my like final projects, it was orientated around painting. Because I thought, mm. was, so they're all being on a computer. And I've got three paintings up in my flat. You can't see, where's one, which is like, on the yellow wall, but right in the corner, basically. But there's another. I one. believe they're there. They're with the bikes. Yeah, the, the bikes are there and there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure they're there. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I'm looking at them. They seem to be there. Ah, <sighs> good. Touching them. Wait. Can you hear that? Ah, oh, yeah. Yep. There's one. That's a bike. Or it's like a, a musical instrument. Oh, yeah, it's just. Um, what instrument? What are they called? I don't even know. <laughs> a little shaker, a rattle. <laughs> the sit is a snake. It's a rattlesnake in the corner. Every yeah. Night, poke him with a stick, and he says yeah. something. Yeah. Pit um, snake. Snake jazz. If anyone gets that reference, they've been watching too much Rick and Morty like me. Yeah. yeah. No, not me, unfortunately. There you go. Over snake my jazz. head. Snake jazz, Rick and Morty. There's some. Uh, something to watch on Netflix. <laughs> well, I don't actually have much better to do, so. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your time. I realise that it must now be half nine there. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I've got another meeting at 11, though, so the night's young for me. <laughs> the night is young. <laughs> <laughs> Big old party time in isolation. <laughs> Exactly, it's it's going to be a rager here. We're going to get some uh, random. I can't even think of anything to drink or eat that you'd have. Oh well, actually, in quarantine, you're not allowed to bring alcohol in. You can buy alcohol from the room menu, but the it's like an exorbitant price thirty eight dollars New Zealand for a bottle of alcohol, which I think is like twenty five euros maybe. So, yeah, it's not really worth it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll have a hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah. Have you the got room, the rooms. What's that? You've got marshmallows. I don't, actually. It's really unfortunate. But the room service lady came around the other day and she says to me, do you want anything? Do you want some new towels, some new bedding, maybe some new laundry detergent? I said, oh, I'm all good. I'd just like some more hot chocolate sachets, please. <laughs> so I'm loaded now. I have a whole lot. Oh, tip as well. Peanut butter and hot chocolate. Do it. Do it. Really? Oh, my, do it. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, that's that's happening in 10 minutes time. Awesome. Spoon of peanut butter. And when you make your hot chocolate, spoon, of, put it in, mix it in. Fuck, it's incredible. Okay, do I put it in when I've done the boiling water? Yeah. Like beforehand or after? Uh, I would normally boil it and make the hot chocolate and then get a spoon. Okay. And as, okay. you, as you mix it in, it like melts in there. Oh, oh good to know. Yeah. I am trying to ration out my peanut butter though. I only, like, it's got to last me till Monday and I don't have much left. But I think in this instance, I will splash out the new some. <laughs> yeah. Let me know what you this think. This is a good life hack. Bonus yeah. number six. <laughs> uh, amazing. Thank you so much for talking bollocks with me for about an hour and a half. I really appreciate Not it. Not a problem. Anytime. Good luck with the New Zealand Nationals. 
When did you Thank say it was you. February? February, yeah. So I've got a bit of time to build up. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be back in reasonable form by then. Ah, it's plenty of time. Loads of time. Yeah. You've got, what, yeah. Three months? Three and a bit months? Yeah. And my Zwift training camp that I've had recently, that's been a good, good head start. So I'm on my way. And uh, enjoy your big 200k, 150k and 130k days with your brother on your glamping bike. Yeah, you're on to it. <laughs> sounds great. Sounds fantastic. Very jealous. <laughs> yeah, enjoy it. yeah, it should be good. Thank you so much. Uh, you have fun with the trench too. Why did you? <laughs> <laughs> You'd forgotten about it for a minute. The world was good and then I reminded you. Yeah, I've got to clean that bike. It's absolutely filthy at the moment. Yeah, a, cl- a dirty bike is not a fast bike, so nope, get it done. Yeah, that's my job today anyway. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop recording now. All right, then.